Good morning. Grace and peace for our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you. I've got a, I didn't have that many announcements, and then I showed up at about 8.30, and now I've got a phone book up here of announcements. So, first things first, we have three birthdays to celebrate. Will Days is turning 20, no, 15? 15, right? Oh, yeah, 15. Emma Pilot had a birthday. Where is she? There she is. Is turning 13. And Steve Brown is splitting the difference. He's 14. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, one more. Louis? Elise Graham. I don't know who you're pointing to. <laughs> oh, Elise Graham. If anybody else is having a birthday, you're going to have to wait till next year. I'm sorry. All right. Another announcement I have is uh, we want to, uh, they are going to set up for the cantata immediately after this service. I don't know what all that entails, but they're looking for volunteers. So immediately after this service, if uh, the choir is looking for some roadies to come and, and set up their stuff in preparation for next week's cantata. And also speaking of cantata, um, They'll be singing the cantata on Saturday night and Sunday. So after the 5 o'clock service on Saturday night, after Saturday night's cantata, the UMW is putting on a chili dinner um, downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. Did I get that, Mary? I did good. All right. All right. So far, so this is going to be a good service. All right. The other thing I want to do is I want to welcome all of our guests and visitors. If we have guests and visitors here, if you do, if that is you, be sure and fill out our Connect card. It's right in front of you in one of those pocket things in the pews, and if you'll fill one of those out for us. Um, and Pastor Charles is going to continue to take pictures through the 19th, through the 19th of this month. So if you haven't gotten your picture taken, and you know who you are, uh, be sure and get your picture taken, if you would. Um, and there, the, he does them right after, before or after service, right through where Sherry's standing over there. Um, Two more things, the Advent Bible study. We had our first, uh, first study on Wednesday night. We had a great crowd, lively conversation. We got through almost half of our lesson plan. Um, it was a good group. I mean, I think everybody engaged, and I learned a lot. And to say that Pastor Jimmy and I are leading it is a, is a stretch. We're, we're there. Um, and the group, there was such great discussion, it kind of led itself. Which is, uh, which is a great a great thing. So if you didn't make the first week, no problem. We'll get you caught up. Uh, be sure and join us every Wednesday uh, for the next three weeks um, at 6 p.m. in the Cox Hall Conference Room. Um, if this isn't something you've done before, then, then what a great thing to do during Advent, kind of a, a new practice to, to engage in. So I invite you to Bible study Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Um, in the Cox Hall Conference Room. And the last thing I want to mention is on the back of your bulletin, on the announcement side, there's a, a blurb in there about the, the Christmas worship services, the Christmas Eve worship services. Those are our, our same times we've, we've always had them, um, 5 p.m. at South, 8 at High Street, and then 11 o'clock here at High Street. But the other thing, since, since uh, the 26th falls on a Sunday, we're going to have one service that Sunday, and it's going to be here. So both campuses are invited here. It's going to be a shorter service. Um, I promise I won't have a, a big old long sermon. I might do a little talking because I don't get paid if I don't talk. So um, there'll be a little talking, but, but it's mostly just going to be singing. And the, and the theme of that service is going to be peace. We're going to celebrate the coming of the Prince of Peace. And if there's anything this world could use a little bit of right now, that is peace. So, so that's going to be the, that service. It'll be, they listed 1030 a.m. at High Street. It's actually going to be at 10. So 10 a.m., High Street on the 26th, just one service. And we put it at 10 because it kind of splits the difference between the 9 o'clock service and the 1030 service that the South Campus folks are used to. All right, I think that's, I think that's all we got. So if I could start with our Advent candle lighting. 
Come on up. Today, on the second service of Advent, we will light the candle of preparation. Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. Let us pray. Merciful God, you sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Lord, give us grace to heed their warnings and to turn from our sins so that we may truly experience the nativity and so that we may await with joy the coming and glory of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God, forever and ever. Amen. If you'll please stand for our opening hymn of praise, which is, Lift up your hearts, ye mighty gates. It's number 213. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. As we share prayer time together, we're reminded that it's important that we pray for one another. It's important that we lift up the needs of our people, and particularly those who have specific kinds of needs that they are inquiring of the church to pray for. So today, as we pray together, you look at the list on the back side of your bulletin for our prayers for today. We certainly <coughs> reach out in our prayers to the Laurentius family and the passing of Drew. We certainly want to remember the other names that are there, Dee Schreiner, Jacob Wiley, Alicia Sauer, Bernice Schornberg, Wayne Frony Barker, Lucy Murray, 
Caitlin Burris, Terry Burford, Jerry Mavers, Lynn Burkett, and Kim Bonney. And along with that, we want to remember in our prayers, Gay Slusher, the grandfather of Emma and Will Days, who's in Barnes Hospital in St. Louis. As we pray today, I trust that we remember these special ones, not only those, but remember those beside of us and front and back of us. And this coming week in our study, as Pastor Brian mentioned, the theme is going to be prayer. And we urge you to be much in prayer this week, not only for one another, but also for our nation. If ever we as a people need to remember each other and support one another, it's now. And through God's grace, we are what we are, and God's promise to be with us regardless of what happens. So let's remember to pray that God will use us in a way to bring joy, peace, and love to a world broken in a time of need. Together, let us pray. Eternal God, we pause today to give you thanks and praise for the privilege of prayer. We know that your word instructs us again and again and again the importance of prayer. So much so that those early disciples inquired of Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, in your mercy, come to us. Instruct us and give us guidance as we open our hearts in prayer. We name these particular special people in our prayers today because they have inquired of the church and invited the church to pray for them. May your Holy Spirit touch them as we anoint them with our prayers and pray that your will would be done to bring peace and comfort and strength. And what we pray for these special ones whose names we lifted up this morning, we pray for all that's our responsibility today, especially we remember our nation and our world at a time of great need. May your Holy Spirit guide us as we share this service together as our pastor brings us the word of life. May we have open minds and open hearts and receive that which can help us be more faithful in our discipleship walk. Help each one of us to be the people we're called to be. In doing that, we're reminded that we are the people of God and nothing can happen to any of us but what you promised to be with us. It's in that promise that we pray our prayers together, praying the words you taught us to pray, praying our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This reading this morning comes from Malachi chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. Look, I am sending my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's, heaven's armies. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a, refine, like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. He will pu purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver, so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Then once more the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Jud Judah and Jerusalem as he did in the past. Our next reading is from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Iteria and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caphias were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who is living in the wilderness. 
Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching the, that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. This is the word of God for the people of God. You please stand for our hymn of preparation, Surely the Presence of the Lord. And Natalie, I'm impressed that you got through all those words. <laughs> I couldn't, I'd had to make them up. <laughs> Man, you may be seated. I want to begin this, this morning's message with a question. Kind of a hypothetical what if question. If you can invite a famous person, either dead or alive, if you can invite a famous person to dinner in your own house, who would you invite? Would it be some famous historical figure? Maybe uh, Thomas Jefferson or Abe Lincoln or Mother Teresa, maybe Martin Luther King Jr. Or would you go the celebrity route and break bread with John Wayne or Jimmy Buffett or perhaps that, uh, that elusive fifth beetle? You know, I guess it kind of depends. It depends on who you invite, but, but what do you think you'd talk about with your guests? What would you serve them for dinner? How about this for a what-if scenario? What if you had the chance to invite Jesus to dine with you in your home? What if you had the chance to sit down and have a face-to-face -face chat with the Messiah right there in your very own living room? Just think of all the, the infinite number of things that, that you could talk with Jesus about. You'd probably ask him a, a million questions. I know I would. I've got a whole list. I wonder, though, if, if you or I would be would be ready for what his answers might be. I wonder if you or I would, would be ready to hear what Jesus might have to say to us. Anyway, let's, let's play this Jesus coming to dinner what if scenario. Let's, let's play it out and, and see where it leads us. Now with your mind's eye, I want you to look around your house. How's the place look? Is it ready for a visit from the son of the living God or do you think you might have a little bit of housework to do? What about those socks laying in the middle of the bedroom floor? What about those dirty dishes in the sink? Do you really think those three-year-old people magazines that are laying on your coffee table, do you really think they're hiding the dust? <laughs> Probably not. Have you ever noticed that there's just something about, there's something about the, the presence of an outsider that, that really calls to attention all of our messes? brings to attention to our, the all-too-familiar chaos that fills our day-to-day -day lives. Have you ever noticed that the more that you, the more that you unclutter your stuff, the more the dirt shows, and the more cleaning you have to do? You know, Evelyn Underhill, she's an author, and she wrote this little devotional. It's entitled, The, the House of the Soul. And she talks about this very thing. She says that our spiritual lives often mirror the natural state of our domestic life. In other words, the house reflects the spirit of the inhabitant. In her book, she uses, she uses housekeeping as kind of a metaphorical means of, of helping us to examine our spiritual life, to look for the dust and the cobwebs and the dark corners, to take inventory and clean out the junk drawers of our life. And you know, if you think about it, don't we all have a, 
have ways of hiding our messes, and don't we all have a tendency to want to fill our lives with, with all kinds of clutter in an effort to hide our messes from others and even hide our messes from ourselves? Well, the messengers in today's scripture lessons, they, they seem to have a knack for seeing beneath the, the surface clutter. They have some sort of spiritual x-ray vision that enables them to see into the junk drawers of our lives and underneath the beds of our spiritual lives. Today we heard from, from two such messengers, John the Baptist and the prophet Malachi. Now I'm pretty sure that most of us are familiar with John the Baptist. He's that, that New Testament prophet. He's Jesus' half-cousin. He's the one that God tapped on the shoulder and said, hey, look, your job is to pave the way for the coming Messiah. I think we know about him. But I'm thinking it might be worth our time to familiarize ourselves with, with who Malachi was and what he was all about. So Malachi was the last of the Old Testament prophets, and scholars say that he penned his contribution to the canon of Scripture <clears throat> somewhere around 430 B.C. And like the Old Testament prophets that that preceded him, Malachi had the dirty job of pointing out the unfaithfulness and the disobedience of God's people. In other words, his message from God was aimed at his own neighbors, the people who lived and, and worshipped at the temple in Jerusalem. And through Malachi, God confronted his people about their insincerity and their complacent worship. Now, if you haven't read it, I recommend you do so. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty short. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy to understand. In essence, it's a graphic dialogue between a righteous God and his hardened, apathetic people. And since Malachi's prophecy comprised the last words in the Old Testament, his words from God, they, they kind of serve as a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And even though he paints kind of a bleak picture of Israel's unrighteousness and their, and their well-deserved judgment, woven throughout this short little book is a message of hope and the possibility of forgiveness. And not only that, in the verses that, that Natalie just read, Malachi looks forward to the coming of John the Baptist and even looks, looks forward to the coming of Christ. Like I said, oh Malachi, he, he provides us with the bridge that spans that 400-plus year chasm that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament. So, okay, with, with that in mind, back to our what-if scenario. Now that you know about both of our messengers, let me ask you this. Raise your hand if you'd like to invite John the Baptist or Malachi to your home for dinner. Yeah, I wouldn't either. <laughs> they both seem to be wound pretty tight, wouldn't you say? They're extremely focused. And I get the impression that these two dudes probably wouldn't be too good at making chit-chat or engaging in, in pleasantries. But it wouldn't really matter because chances are, even though you might be inclined to invite them to dinner, I bet they wouldn't accept your invitation. You see, their job is not to be the honored guest. Their job is to get us ready for the arrival of the honored guest. Their one and only function in life is to remind us that company's coming and to point us to the reality that we got a lot of work to do. So with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer to the forehead, these messengers' job is to tell us to stop wasting time, take stock in what needs to be done, and then get busy doing it. They kind of remind me of a, of a command sergeant major I used to have to deal with at Fort Riley. Oh, command sergeant major Edwards. I spent the last 18 months of my military career serving as the commander of the 82nd Medical Company. And ever since the helicopter became a thing in the Army, medevac helicopter units have always been the oddballs of Army aviation. They are the only unit on the airfield that pretty much did its own thing with little supervision from on high because nobody really understood what we did in the first place. And that was certainly the case at Fort Riley's Marshall Army Airfield. All the other units flew tank-killing Apache gunships. But way down at the end of the flight line, far away from the gung-ho gunship dudes, were our 15 unarmed flying ambulances. Well, anyway, about six months after I took command, 
we were blessed with a, with a new brigade commander. This guy was an Apache gunship flying, gung-ho, tank killing brigade, or brigade commander. He was a full bird colonel whose one goal in life was to make general. That made him dangerous. This guy was army through and through, and he had a reputation of dining on oddball medevac unit commanders for breakfast. That'd be me. Well, as is the custom, within the first few months of a brigade change of command, the head honcho himself conducts a walkthrough inspection of all of his subordinate units. So as a means of helping units get ready for, their, for the fire-breathing brigade commander's arrival, the brigade command sergeant major conducts a pre-inspection. Now let me just tell you, the pre-inspection was infinitely more painful than the actual brigade commander's visit. It was more painful because the command sergeant major's job was to point out every single deficiency, no matter how minute, so that we could get it fixed before the old man arrived on the scene. And trust me when I tell you that Command Sergeant Major Edwards, he, he didn't make rank because of his pleasant personality or his compassionate concern for others' feelings. By the time he was done with the pre-inspection, myself and the 110 guys under my command, we felt more like a substandard Cub Scout pack than a tested, combat-tested military unit. But because we heeded the painful advice of our partially human Command Sergeant Major, the brigade commander's visit was a breeze. We were prepared. So when I read in the Bible about the, the less than pleasant demeanors of John the Baptist and old Malachi, the first thing that comes to my mind is my old aviation brigade sergeant major, command sergeant major Edwards. So back to our Jesus coming to dinner scenario. Obviously getting ready for Jesus, it demands our full attention. The problem is, this is uncharted territory for us. If not uncharted, then perhaps long forgotten. Just think about it. We rarely give anything our full attention. In our day-to-day -day worlds, multitasking is a way of survival, isn't it? Can you imagine surviving in our 21st century world without your cell phone? How else could we possibly keep up with all the com competing demands of work and church and family and social life and, and school and everything else? It seems that if we're not doing at least two things simultaneously, then we're not trying hard enough. We're slackers. And then, right on cue, along comes the messenger. And what's the messenger do? Well, according to scripture, the messenger calls us to re-examine ourselves, re-examine our priorities. With a sense of urgency that precludes any concern whatsoever for our feelings, they point out all the stuff in our lives that keeps us from attending to what's really important. They prompt us to examine our ways and to examine ourselves and to do it from the inside out. They help us perceive what needs to be cleared out and carted away. They point out the areas of our lives that need cleaning and refurbishing. So while old John John the Baptist and Malachi, they, they may not be represented or memorialized in your home's Christmas decor. These two prophets are all about Christmas preparation. In fact, I think we should call them what they really are, and that's the Advent prophets. Now, as any kid will tell you, Christmas is just three weeks away, a little over three weeks away. Before we know it, we'll all be gathering here to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Emmanuel, which means God with us. In other words, we'll be commemorating the time in history when God came and lived among us as one of us. The time when God, in the form of Jesus, came to visit our earthly home. So with that in mind, are you ready? If not, what do you need to get done between now and then so that your spiritual house will be ready? You know, even our willingness to stop and ask that question, that's a good first step. After all, isn't the first step to solving a problem simply acknowledging that you have a problem in the first place? We know we're distracted. We know that we too often cherish the wrong things and withhold our love from the right things. We know that we're often selfish with our time and our talents and our resources. 
But embedded in Malachi's gruffness is a hopeful alternative. If we're open to it, and if we're willing to acknowledge that we've got some last-minute house cleaning to do, Malachi says the great purifier will give us a hand and help us get ready. All we have to do is admit our need and ask for help. While all this has to do with the immediate need of preparing ourselves to engage in the true meaning and the full magnitude of Christ's birth, this isn't just an Advent thing. I think our Advent prophets would agree that, that this is a way of life we're talking about. It's a way of life that we're called to live throughout our Christian journey. It's none other than a call to, to faithfully commit ourselves to daily live into what it means to love God with our whole selves and to get rid of all the clutter in our lives that gets in the way of us doing so. Now, as you may know, my undergraduate degree came from a Catholic college, St. Benedict's College in Atchison, Kansas. It's perched on a river, on a river bluff, and it, and it overlooks, up on this river bluff is St. Benedict's Abbey, and it overlooks the campus. And this abbey is the home of 100 plus or so Benedictine monks. Now, as a private school, St. Benedict's has, has the freedom to make up its own rules and institute its own requirements, and it's really good at doing that. Therefore, as was required of all freshman men, I got the opportunity to spend a couple of weeks living like a monk in the abbey. Yeehaw. And let me tell you, living the monastic routine day in and day out is a long way from the stereotypical college experience. For one thing, monastic parties are really, really boring. And the fact that there were no girls at those parties, that didn't help much. And the music was definitely old school. I have no idea who the, composer, the composers were, but in comparison, Charles Wesley is, is like a hairband rock star. But my point is, anyway, the thing I remember most about that experience was the uninterrupted focused prayer time. The days began and ended with morning and evening vespers. And before lunch was served, there was a prayer devotional. And before dinner, there was mass. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. That's not all those monks did every day. They did have real jobs outside the abbey. Most were college professors and, or school administrators or parish priests, and some were all three. But at set points throughout the day, they stopped the multitasking, and they focused their attention on one thing, prayer. Formal prayer had its own focused and uninterrupted time. The monks of St. Benedict's Abbey master the art of one thing at a time. Now, couldn't all of us Christians learn to honor God better through the purity of one thing at a time? While we may not opt for the regimented life of a monastic, there's definitely something we can learn from those who do. Like all of us, those devout Christian men sought to live with God fully present in their lives. And if we want God to be part of our lives, we have to prepare a, a place for God in the midst of our lives. Who among us would invite a guest to dinner and then not prepare a place at the table for him? You know, you can agree or disagree with the monastic way of life, but when it comes to preparing a place for God in their presence, those old monks definitely got it right. So you want to invite Jesus to your home and into your heart this Christmas. If that's the case, then, then ask yourself, is there room in your spiritual house for another? Or in keeping with the spirit of the season, is there room in your inn for Jesus? As you wait for the Messiah's arrival, what sort of last-minute spiritual housekeeping remains to be done? Is the way prepared for your Savior's arrival? Is it straight and smooth? Is it free from damaging distractions? The messengers, they call each of us as individuals to focus on one thing first and foremost, and that's just loving God. 
But in order to do that, we have to prepare. We have to train. We have to be open to what needs to be fixed and cleaned up within yourself. But you've got to be warned. You'll never finish mastering God's love. And therefore, you'll never be too prepared to receive that love in your life. You have to make ready again and again for the coming of Christ. You have to make ready again and again for God's love who came to live in your world and even now seeks to take up residence in your heart. The messenger, our Advent prophet, cries, prepare the way of the Lord. Make the path straight. My prayer is that, is that we find time to do just that in these last days before Christmas, and even more importantly, that we continue to do so in all the days that follow. Amen. page 17 in your handouts in the middle. The Lord be with you. 
lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice would come down like waters and righteousness like the ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. <laughs> On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit and us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in this one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Our Lord welcomes all to his table, all those who accept his love in your, into your lives, all those who accept the responsibility of reflecting that love into the lives of others. 
Our Lord has prepared a meal for us. So come. This is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Let me offer us a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that, that you love us so much that you sent your son to save us. And, and even as you ask us to prepare for his coming, you don't just ask us to prepare, but you provide a way for us to prepare. You ask us to open our hearts to you so that you can forgive us and you can, you can clean out the cobwebs and clean out the clutter of the junk drawers of our lives, so that when your son returns, we're ready to receive him and him in the fullness of his love and the fullness of his glory. Lord, thank you for loving us so much. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll please stand for our closing hymn, which is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, number 349. We've come to the end of our worship service here, but our ministry has just begun. The work of the church is beyond these walls, and as we leave here today, we're reminded as a people of God, we are responsible to reach beyond these walls and share the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as we go, we are not alone. We go in the presence of a God who promises never to leave us nor forsake us, a God who's with us. I go in peace and may the blessing of the Lord be our strength and guide today and always. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen.